Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here at Element City Church. Uh, and if you are new, we are thrilled to have you here. We know it takes courage coming to a new place. I met a couple of you who are new already, and so thanks so much for taking a chance on us, and we're thrilled to have you here. If you are new, tuning in online. Hello. Uh, glad to have you as well. If you're tuning in from home or watching this throughout the week, uh, it is just a real joy to, to gather in the house and to gather together. And so we pray that tonight would be just a great encouragement to you, no matter where you are in your faith journey. And so uh, a couple different things. If you happen to be new, we would love to connect with you. We could do that in a couple different ways. Uh, we have a connection card that you can download our app. Our app is free. If you just go to your app store, type in Elements with an S, Element City Church. You'll find it. The connection card's like the third tile down. Click that. A couple quick texts back and forth, and we are connected and walking with you for the next four or five weeks. I promise we won't spam you, but we will be able to help uh, you find answers to things and questions around here. If you're online, uh, top right button is a connection card. You can fill that out as well. Uh, or you can text the word hello to our text number, which is 520 340 6868. Just text the word hello. And we'll get back with you a couple texts, and we're connected. So we would love to have you be a part of connecting with us. I know you're not cheering for me. I know you're cheering for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That guy with the mic, he's old hat. Okay. Um, but, hey, we are thrilled to gather together tonight. And uh, we're going to start off just a couple different quick things. One, you'll hear more about this at the end. But remember, next week is our potluck, our old school church potluck. So how you can help us with that is go on the app and sign up. Bring it next week. You can plug it in if it's in a crock pot. Uh, we'll have it in the, uh, the gymnasium, which is right behind here. Next week, we're also having a dessert auction. All tips, it's free because you're bringing the food, uh, but all tips and all dessert auction money will go to help send kids to camp this summer. We've got seven or eight students that want to go to camp. We want to help reduce the cost for that so you can be a part of that uh, next week. So sign up this week. We have the Church of the Week is the Springs Church, which is dear to our heart. Jeff Goodman, Brandon Johnson, who was my intern a long time ago, was a part of Elements when we first launched. Uh, he's the executive pastor there. So if you're here in the house, I'd invite you to stand where you're at. If you're at home, you can stand if you want. But we're going to pray for the Church of the Week for our time together tonight. We're going to sing a little bit. Lyle's got a great message as we continue to look at the Sermon on the Mount this summer. And uh, we're just going to have a great time tonight. So, Father, we pray and pause. All of us come throughout this week with different things running through our mind or agenda items to come. And we hit pause right now. Just ask that your spirit would meet us in a fresh and new way. God, whether we are searching out spiritual things or whether we've been walking with you for a long time, you've got a word for us tonight as we worship you, give our attention in your direction. Father, we pray for the Springs Church, uh, for Brandon, for Jeff. Pray for wisdom and their leadership, for their teams that they lead, for the people that call that church home. We know there's a million plus people in this city in South Southwest that are not connected in any faith community. And so one church can't reach them all. And so we pray your blessing over the Springs Church. God, I know they're looking for a property and want to build. And so I'm asking you'd surprise them even this week or this month with some opportunities that would begin to expand that. God, uh, would you continue to let your presence be in and with us as we continue to, to try to be the church that you're calling us to be? Would you lead us forward in that? Bless our evening as we worship you, as we look into your word. Would you help us just feel and sense your presence and leave here different because we spent time together and we spent time with you. We pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Trust to steal what you say Saying I have no reason to praise I will give thanks Yeah, I will give thanks When the roar that I hear Is the voice of my fear Try to silence my hope in my heart I will give thanks I will give thanks 
song of thanksgiving is my battle cry With joy as my weapon, I'll stand and defy The lie of the dark with my hands lifted to the sky I will rejoice The grip of 
of fear has no hold on me. So where, oh death, where is your sting? No longer I who lives, now Jesus lives in me.
sound forever Heart in heaven together Singing holy is your name And if it lifts you higher Burn in me your desire Passion worthy of your name Hold this sound forever Faith in 
church to pay your light Let my flame see right King of kings, come is what we absolutely nothing that he can't forget so if there's something heavy in your heart right now just lay it out before the Lord there is absolutely nothing that he can take he already lifted all the burdens from your shoulders he took it to the cross he crucified that and he gave you the victory in the name of Jesus so you can be free tonight let's just take a moment and worship him 
Spirit, we come before you. Our hearts are before you, God. We surrender ourselves, Lord. We just ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to be here and to do the work in our hearts. There's so much work that needs to be done, God. And you are patient with us. You are merciful. You're gracious. You're kind. You're always good. So, Lord, we trust in your work and the work of the Holy Spirit. So whatever you have tonight in store for each heart here, God, we ask that you would do that. Would you please move in the power of the Holy Spirit? Lord, I pray that our hearts would be transformed tonight, that we would be forever changed. Because we are made to worship you, to bring the glory, the most beautiful glory to your name. God, we also pray for Lyle as he delivers the word. Holy Spirit, move through him. Speak your words. We trust in your word, God. We thank you. And we're thankful for this church and for the community of beautiful and different people. Lord, we love you and we pray all these things in your precious and beautiful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Please be seated. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Lyle, uh, and I just want to thank you again for joining us tonight as we continue to worship uh, in the Word of God. And I really wanted to start out tonight just by saying that regardless of where you are, whether you're sitting here in the room right now, um, whether you're joining us from home and you're worshiping on the couch, uh, whether you're listening to this during your morning workouts, whether you're listening to this in your car, wherever you are right now, I believe that God wants to speak to you tonight. I believe that God has a word for you, uh, that he wants you to hear a word that he wants you to respond to in faith in the coming days as well. And I don't say that because of the quality of anything that I'm about to say or anything that I've written down here. I say that because I know the quality of the God that wants to speak to you tonight. And so I believe that is true for each and every one of you. And that's been my prayer throughout the week as I've been preparing this message is that God uh, would have a message for every single one of us with what we're gonna look at tonight. So we are four weeks into our Sermon on the Mount series. This series is gonna take us all the way through into the end of July. This is probably uh, the longest series that we've done, at, at least certainly in the last four or five years, 13 weeks, as we just look at the Sermon on the Mount and the words that Jesus had to preach uh, to his followers, to his disciples. And if you add in the eight weeks of uh, covering the Beatitudes that we did last spring, that is 21 weeks that we have spent just on this one section. That's how key this section is um, for us to understand what it is to be a follower of Jesus in the way that he wants us to follow after him. So we're gonna nerd out right away. I know I like to get into the five minute nerd out. It's gonna be five-ish minutes, okay? So uh, we're just gonna dive right in uh, because I wanna teach you some Greek tonight. Who's excited to learn some Koine Greek? That's right, several of you are. That's more than I expected, actually. That's fantastic, I'm excited about that. So as we get into Greek, uh, the reason I wanna kind of point out these uh, kind of themes is because I think that there's two key themes that as uh, Jack and I both have been studying the Sermon on the Mount that run throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Like it just in this sermon, you cannot escape that these themes exist. And it's really important for us to, to know that so that as we read the text and as we go through this, we'll see what exactly Jesus is saying. So this first theme is this, it's human flourishing. That comes from a Greek word, uh, say this after me, say makarios. Makarios, that's right. It's a Greek word, uh, and this word is a very loaded word. I don't mean that it's drunk. It's a very loaded word in that this is a difficult word to translate into English because it is so packed with meaning. And we talked about that last year when we did go through the Beatitudes, kind of this idea of Makarios blessing. Like we always see in the, the beginning of the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed uh, are the persecuted. So Jesus is talking about blessed are, and then fill in the blank. The word that's being used there is Makarios are the whatever. 
And so we would see that word blessed and it would be really easy for us to infer from that that what he's talking about is uh, the person who is like this has divine favor. A lot of times when we think of blessing, we think of the things that the divine uh, beings have given to us that we believe that God, the only creator of the universe, has given his people things. We would call that a blessing. Uh, And so when we see blessed are those who do this or blessed are the um, poor in spirit, blessed are the mourners, uh, we would look at that and we would think of God's divine favor. And yet there's so much more to that. And so Jack and I have been reading through a book by a man named Jonathan T. Pennington uh, called The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing. And he would argue that, yes, there is an element of divine blessing in Makarios, but it's so much more than that. There's so much more. It's, if you were to look at someone's life and you were to see that they were living a whole life, like just whole, like it's, it's united. Everything that they do, there's a singular purpose and a focus and it's beautiful. And yes, they struggle, they have difficulties and yet they navigate it with grace. And you're just, you look from the outside in and you would see that and you would think, I want that. I want that level of flourishing in my life. That's Makarios. That's a theme that runs all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, the the gentleman who wrote the book that I just referred to said this. Uh, He said, I think the Sermon on the Mount is a piece of wisdom teaching. So he's talking about this as, it's almost like the Proverbs. It's kind of fascinating to think about the sermon being about something similar to a proverb. So I think the sermon is a piece of wisdom teaching from Jesus that invites people into true human flourishing through wholeness, centered on God and his coming kingdom. Jesus' sermon invites us to see the world in a certain way and to be in the world in a certain way that accords with God's nature, will, and coming reign upon the earth. In short, righteousness. It is a call to faith-based discipleship in Jesus, the Son of God. It's beautiful. So as we look at the scriptures, as we look at the sermon over these coming weeks, we want to keep that idea of Makarios in mind. Uh, Another thing that we can easily forget that's kind of woven into the threads of the Sermon on the Mount is this uh, idea of suffering for the sake of kingdom righteousness. What's fascinating is Jesus is actually saying through this that those who endure hardship for the sake of pursuing righteousness are the ones who will flourish. And so if we kind of recap to where we're at right now, uh, it starts out with the Beatitudes. I've got that up here, kind of an outline. You've got the Beatitudes that Jesus starts the sermon with these blessed sayings. There's about uh, 10 of them. Um, some scholars say nine. You, there's arguments. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know all that stuff. First 12 verses, Jesus sits down, gives the Beatitudes. After that, the first week of the sermon uh, on the Mount series, Jack talked about the salt and the light passage where uh, Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so we are to let our light shine before men. And he starts to move into this next section. That's where we've been over the last couple weeks on how to have kingdom righteousness. So if we want to be Makarios people and we want our flourishing to be seen by all, Jesus starts this section out by saying, uh, hey, I've come not just to abolish the law, okay? I'm not here to do that at all. So Jesus is telling us the Old Testament matters. For those of us who don't like reading the Old Testament, sorry, it's Jesus' Bible. He wants you to read it, okay? So we need to know a little bit about that. And Jesus is saying, I'm not here to, to abolish that. I'm here to actually fulfill it. And kind of a, a key theme that comes out as he finishes through all of that of, of showing you how he fulfills it and what it looks like to be a person who lives with kingdom righteousness, he finishes up with a really heavy verse in verse 48 where he says, you are to be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect. And so it's this hammer blow that comes down and you even hear me say that and you're like, yeah, <laughs> I'm out. That's not me, right? That's me. I get it. I, I see that and I'm like, I, well, hold on, Jesus. That's pretty heavy. Who can do that? How can we do that? And if we look at the Greek, this is the second Greek word that I want you to, to learn with me tonight. It's the word teleos. Go and say teleos. Teleos. Um, this is a word that has popped up for whatever reason in my own reading and studies since probably December of last year. And uh, so it's just been fascinating as I've looked at different books and I've just started to see this theme of teleos um, showing up. So the, the Greek there, to be teleos, as the Heavenly Father is teleos, is, is what's being said there. Um, it comes from the Old Testament as well. So if you know anything about the Old Testament, there's multiple times that God will say, you are to be holy as I am holy. Now, when uh, the first set of nerdy people, kind of like me, like got together to translate the Bible from uh, Hebrew and to actually write it down into Greek for the first time, we call that the Septuagint. When those scholars got together, they translated that passage when God says, you are to be holy as I'm holy. The word that they chose to use there is teleos. And 
this first century Judaism, they had this idea that holiness wasn't just necessarily about God being set apart, the way that we would think about that. Teleos can also uh, talk about a wholeness. And you see that I've got that teleos and wholeness. Think about what it looks like to have a divided heart. In fact, if I say that, and you, 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 some of you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that, that maybe in one setting you're a certain way. And so with your friends, you act like this. And yet when you're around your family and everyone else, you act a totally different way. Maybe when you go to your job, you have to have a certain set of skills and you have to have a certain kind of personality and you act this way. And then when you get home and when you're interacting with others, you act that way. Um, some of us, if we're being honest, we might harbor some sin in our lives that we don't want other people to know about. And so when I say divided heart, I think almost every person in this room kind of gets that feeling. They understand what it means to have a divided heart because we've all lived with that. And so what, what the scriptures are telling us is if we want to be teleos, we need to have a wholeness to us. We need to be unified. We need to have a, a better word here, integrity. That we are the same through and through. That we don't have to have that divided heart. We don't have to behave one way over here and another way over here. So you want to be the makarios person, the person who's flourishing. You need to be teleos. The other interesting thing with the word teleos is you can translate it as um, perfect because it, it comes from another Greek word, telos. Uh, again, we're getting super nerdy. I know we're a little bit past five minutes. Hold on, we're almost done uh, with all of that. But telos talks about like an end. So the end to which something is created, right? So if I'm holding a phone here, somebody created this phone and they had a reason for designing it the way that they designed it and a purpose behind the way that they did everything with it. Now, if I know nothing about electronics, say I'm from a third world country and I don't even know there's a button that turns this thing on and I just pick this thing up and you see me start scooping food and eating it with this, I'd be like, man, this is an amazing spoon, right? You'd look at me like I'm kind of insane. Why? Because uh, the phone is not fulfilling the purpose for which it's created. And so when you were designed by God, he designed you with a purpose, with a telos. And so in this uh, culture in Jesus' time, to be teleos means that I am fulfilling the purpose for which I've designed, and that is how I achieve perfection. Does that resonate with anybody? That should be a beautiful thought, to know that God created you with a specific design, with a specific purpose in mind, and that you will find wholeness and joy when you get to fulfill that. That's a key theme that we'll see in the sermon. So it's the second kind of theme that we see running all throughout it. But ultimately what Jesus wants us to see in this passage that we're going to be looking at, we're kind of in the middle of these six examples that Jesus gives of, hey, it's been said in the law that this is the case. That's true. Here's the spirit behind what that law. Like, why did we create that law? Why did God place that before his people to follow? Here's how you fulfill it. This is why. This is what you can do because uh, what we'll see is just because the law allows you to do something doesn't mean that it will lead to your flourishing, nor does it lead to the wholeness that God requires of those in his kingdom. Just because the law allows you to rack up a whole bunch of credit card debt, okay, you're not going to flourish if you do so, right? Just because the law might say it's okay for us to go to Peter Piper Pizza and I can order three pizzas and eat all three pizzas in one sitting, A, that's disgusting, but two, that's definitely not going to lead to me flourishing, right? Just because the law allows you to yell at that retail worker who made a mistake doesn't mean that that's going to lead to you flourishing. Jesus' teachings are a call to a way of being in the world that teaches us to look inward and become a different kind of people a vision of virtue. A radical reorientation to our thinking often requires hyperbolic speech. That's what Jonathan T. Pennington said. And so as we look into this passage tonight, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and get that out. Some of you are like, gosh, he's 10 minutes in. He hasn't even talked about the Bible yet. What's going on? Don't judge. Calm down. We're getting there. So Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be tonight. We're going to be in verses 38 through 42. Uh, if you want to follow along in the YouVersion app, we've got all the notes there as well. Um, but as, as you're finding your way to Matthew 5, that last comment there that Jesus wants us to have a radical reorientation to the way that we look at the law and look at the things that Jesus is calling us to do if we want to be his followers. And so he's going to be using some hyperbole. And if you're not familiar with that phrase, it just means he's going to exaggerate. 
He has to kind of shock us a little bit to get us to see what he wants us or how he wants us to live. So read with me, starting in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. It says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Hold up. That's heavy, right? How many of you have heard the phrase, eye for an eye? It's a cliche in our culture, right? Like most of us have heard that. Uh, This uh, was something that was long called the lex talionis. So back in Hebrew culture, uh, they called it the lex talionis. It meant law according to kind. Uh, and so it might seem harsh. It's kind of violent language when you hear that. Uh, and yet the intention behind this law, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it's actually positive, not negative. The rule of lex talionis, which is also found outside of the biblical witness in many other ancient cultures, was actually designed to prevent two wrongs. Severe retribution that did not fit the crime and self-appointed vigilante action. It's all too easy for revenge to quickly get out of hand and for the ones seeking justice to be controlled by their passions and for well-intentioned responses to actually become violent reactions that often end up doing more damage than the original crime and spiraling into more violence and instability. This is why the Lex Talionis exists and why it actually continues to be a part of our Western culture today. And so Jesus doesn't contradict this. we got to see that. Jesus doesn't contradict this, but in the second part here, what he's going to do, he's going to offer a true heart-level virtue that corresponds precisely with this command. Jesus is speaking to the heart of the matter. Don't be a vengeful, vigilante, self-justified distributor of justice. The Bible just canceled Batman, folks. I'm sorry. I mourn that. I love Batman. I'm sorry. I had to fit it in there. But what Jesus is saying is that there is a righteousness that is greater and more beautiful than self-justice. That letting God be the judge, letting him be the righteous maker, he's the one who's going to put the world to right. And so Jesus is not just telling us here, don't retaliate. He's actually saying, don't even resist the one who wants to do evil toward you. But keep in mind, and I think that this caveat's important, uh, this is referring to self-interactions. This is like your personal life. If you look out and you see another person being wronged, as Christians, we absolutely want to jump to their defense. And we want to stand for justice. We want to stand for truth. That's okay. What Jesus is demanding of us here, he's saying that on a personal level, when someone comes to insult you and to attack you, that's when we have to not even resist the evildoer. So if we see someone being wronged, We can still stand up for them. We should. As Christians, that's what he wants us to do. But when we are the ones who are wronged, he calls us to respond with humility because Jesus wants his followers to cultivate a new heart attitude toward retaliation. And so he gives us four examples of how to do so as we continue reading through here. Uh, The first example is also in Matthew 5, 39. Uh, We'll read that verse. It says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So how many of you have heard the phrase, turn the other cheek? Another cliche, right? This passage is full of cliches tonight. It's going to be great. We've heard all these things. Uh, But the way that this is worded in Greek, just to give you a little bit of context, the idea of uh, what Jesus says is someone slaps you on the right cheek. Okay, if someone's going to hit you on the right cheek, uh, they're in front of you, right? Usually what would happen is they would open hand, smack you across the face. Okay, so we're not talking about they're trying to deal a knockout blow. We're talking about this is a person who wants to insult you. Somebody wants to embarrass you. That's why they're right across the face. And what does Jesus tell us to do? He says, if someone wants to hurl insults at you, they want to humiliate you, if you want to be the type of person that can be received into my Father's kingdom, you must be willing to endure insults and you must be willing to endure embarrassment in front of others. And that kind of leads us to the first challenge. Uh, The way I phrase it is this. Jesus wants us to be unoffendable. I'm probably taking liberties with the English language there. I understand that if you'll allow me. Uh, Be unoffendable. And the reason that I worded it this way is um, we could talk about being willing to suffer insult. We can talk about being humble enough to not react when somebody does try to embarrass us. Um, But I want you to think about a situation in your own life, maybe something that's happened recently uh, or in the past, but think about a time where insult uh, and or embarrassment happened. Why did you want to retaliate in that moment? What is it within us that happens that causes us to want to strike back? And sure, maybe he's talking about physically striking back, but maybe in this day and age, paying attention to how we say things, I think it's really easy to verbally attack people. 
We live in a day and an age where it's really easy to get behind a keyboard and do that. What is it that happens inside of us that, that, that causes us to have to lash out and to have to do that? James, the brother of Jesus, he wrote this in his own book, uh, in chapter four, verse one of the book of James. Uh, he said, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? That word passions, you could also translate it as your pleasures, meaning uh, the things that you want for yourself. What do you want in a moment of insult? What is it we're looking for in a moment of embarrassment? We want vindication, right? Usually justice. We wanna look like the good guy, like we were the one who was in the right when something like that happens. And so when we take offense to something that's happened to us, it's actually our pride that's also taken a hit, if we're being honest. And the human thing to do, the very human thing to do, hear me on that, is to react so that we can save face or so that we can restore pride. And yet, Jesus is saying that that's a war that happens inside of all of us. That's what causes fights, and that he's calling us to a better way. He's calling us to live differently. He wants us to not only receive the insulting blow, but then to present the other cheek in case the evildoer isn't done insulting us. Whoa. That's hard. One thing that's helped me, uh, and I don't know that this will help you or not, but uh, it's nice to know that God calls us all children for a reason. How many of you remember the TV show, Kids Say the Darndest Things? Right, just it was kids being interviewed by a comedian. Uh, we canceled Bill Cosby, so we can't mention him, but kids were being interviewed by a comedian, and so uh, they would just say things that people would crack, out, uh, you know, crack up because they'd say cute stuff, and what happens with like a four-year-old? This is a true story. If a four-year-old comes up to you and is like, hey, poo-poo head, what do you do? You laugh, right? Happened to me. Happens to me frequently. Uh, it's fine. There's a, Clarissa's kids are awesome, okay? Like, I love having fun with them. You know, I'm always stinky. It's, it's great. And I, it's, we have fun because he's four, you know, like they're little kids. You don't expect that much out of a little kid. And, and when they say stuff like that, we blow it off. And so uh, what if we actually viewed all people as children of God who just say the darndest things? You know, it's, it's hard to get there. Um, but that's been something that's helped me shrug off some offense in the past is just to remind myself, man, this is just another child of God. Sometimes I say that a little more snarky than I did just now. Um, but Paul, one of the most brilliant Christians who ever lived, he said it pretty succinctly in his letter. In 1 Corinthians 6, 7, he said this, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather suffer wrong? And of course, most of us have answers locked and loaded to this question, right? Like right away, we're like, okay, let me just tell you about the situation. Here's all of these things, and here's why I am right. And believe me, I would love to be right, and I'd rather not suffer wrong. And yet, uh, Paul is reiterating the words of Jesus here, that we need to lay this down before him, that we need to be quick to forgive others and to trust God the Father, the only true righteous judge, with the results. It's not an easy thing to do, is it? And yet Jesus doubles down and gives us more instruction. So hooray, there's that. Matthew 5, verse 40, let's continue reading. It says this, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so challenge number one, we wanna be unoffendable. We wanna be the type of people that we can be quick to forgive, that we don't take offense to every little thing that happens. In a day and age where that's easy to do, don't you think that would help us stand out as believers of Jesus if we learned how to not react to every insult that was thrown our way? And yet Jesus calls us to this next thing too. He wants us to be sacrificially generous. Be sacrificially generous. I could have said, be willing to sacrifice. I could have also said, be generous. But really what we see is if we put all of these together, we are to be sacrificially generous. We'll keep looking at the examples Jesus gives in this passage. First example was to turn the other uh, cheek. The next example here, uh, you've probably heard this idiom as well, give someone the shirt off your back, right? Uh, a typical citizen in Jesus' time, uh, just to kind of walk you through, they'd wear a Loincloth, that's fun to say, loincloth. They'd wear their tunic over that, and then they would have this outer cloak that they would wear, okay? The outer cloak is significant because Old Testament law uh, in Exodus 22, 26, and 27 actually established that a person had an inalienable right to that outer cloak. 
It wasn't just this nice jacket that they would wear throughout the day so that they could put out their vibe. It was something that they would use to cover themselves while they would sleep. It had many uses to a person. And so uh, what the scriptures would say is if a person put their cloak up as a pledge, by the end of the day, if you were to receive that cloak, you were to give it back to that person. You couldn't even keep their cloak overnight. That's how important the cloak is. And so Jesus is telling his followers, if someone sues you, someone has an accusation that they're bringing against you, and really the context is telling us, let's say that they're doing it with really awful motives. They just want to commit highway robbery. They want to add insult to injury. And so they're suing you, and they want to sue you for the clothes that you wear. And Jesus is saying this. He's saying, be willing to sacrifice what is rightfully yours in order to bring peace to the situation. If you had an inalienable right to the cloak, and Jesus is saying, take something that is that precious, that is that protected, and be willing to lay that down so that you can live at peace with all. Heavy stuff, right? Turn the other cheek. Be willing to give up anything that you need to. And then he keeps going to the next uh, example. Go the extra mile. Again, Three examples, three cliches, right? Um, And yet this is also another example that needs a little bit of context. Uh, Of course, how many of us love police dramas? Kind of popular, right? Every police movie, any good 70s police movie, what did it have? Had the chase scene, you'd always have like that terrible jazz music that's playing, and there'd always be the moment where the hero needs to go chase after the bad guy, and uh, they didn't have a vehicle, so what would they do? They'd pull over a citizen and be like, I'm commandeering this vehicle, and then they'd take the vehicle, and there'd be this wonderful jump scene, right, like it's usually in San Francisco, because they've got the hilly streets, and they would chase down the criminal, and they'd bring him to justice because they commandeered the vehicle. Um, well, the idea behind commandeering something in, in Roman, uh, when a Roman, when a city, I can't talk tonight, when a city would be under Roman occupation, words, they, they're starting to come out again, sorry. Uh, a city would be under Roman occupation. Uh, a Roman citizen had the right, especially the soldiers, they had the right to approach any citizen, interrupt whatever you're doing and demand that you carry their luggage for them. Not really cool, Right? Think if you're a first century Jewish person, you're probably pretty proud. And let's be honest, even today, if someone just interrupted your day and is like, hey, that's my stuff, I need you to carry it. Some of you might have some choice words for that person, right? Um, But the Romans also wanted to protect their citizens. Yes, the soldiers needed to have some authority and respect shown to them. But a Roman soldier couldn't demand that you carry their stuff any farther than one Roman mile. That was it. So what Jesus is actually saying here when he says, if someone asks you to carry their stuff a mile, that's, this is the picture. A Roman citizen, a person, one of your occupiers, one of your enemies is approaching you and asking you to stop everything you're doing and to carry something a mile. And Jesus is saying this. I love this, how uh, William Barclay put it. He says, suppose your masters come to you and compel you to be a guide or a porter for a mile. Don't go a mile with bitter and obvious resentment. Go two miles with cheerfulness and with a good grace. What Jesus is saying is, don't be always thinking of your liberty to do as you like. Be always thinking of your duty and your privilege to be of service to others. When a task is laid on you, even if the task is unreasonable and hateful, don't do it as a grim duty to be resented. Do it as a service to be gladly rendered. That's beautiful. And yet it's still difficult, isn't it? We can hear all this stuff and be like, yeah, I want that. And he's still not even done. Jesus still isn't done. The fourth example, he says this, always be ready to give in verse 42. Give to the one who asks from you. And so you're probably thinking, okay, what? Give what? Like money, time, clothing, food? Like what am I supposed to give? And I'd say yes. Yes to all of those things, because Jesus is calling us to be ready to give, to meet any need at any point in time. And yet, here's the reality. Remember, Jesus is using hyperbole. Let's take it back to the beginning. I kind of warned you, Jesus is going to say some things to shock his followers. He has to do it, because if you think about it, whenever we get ingrained in a certain way of thinking, it usually takes something pretty shocking to stir us out of thinking the same way. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He's using drastic examples to show us what he means. 
Good teachers recognize uh, what Jesus recognized, and so that's why he's using this hyperbole. The fact is I doubt that anybody in this room is ever going to get to the point uh, where you're just giving and giving and giving stuff away to the point where you're like, oops, I guess I don't have anything else. And the rest of your life, you're walking around naked and homeless. Okay, it's not gonna happen. Let's be honest, it's not gonna happen. But what Jesus is challenging us to do is to give what we can when we can. The disciples are a great example of this. If we look at Acts chapter three, Peter uh, is walking along with some of the disciples and a man who's been lame for a long time uh, is just asking for money. And so Peter leans to the man and says, I don't have any silver, I don't have any gold, but what I do have, I give to you. And so he prays with the man, he heals the man, the man leaps up, he's dancing, he's praising God. And you're just like, seriously, you're gonna use an example where a guy prays for him and then they just dance up and like, I'm not gonna heal anybody. Uh, Listen, I'll be honest, I've never healed anybody in my life. I've never had that happen, okay? For you, most of us in this room, it may not happen either, and that's okay. But what happened in that moment is this. Peter recognized he had something to give, and Peter stopped and gave it. That's the principle we need to look at. What do you have to give in any given moment? That's what God is asking for you to be willing to lay down to serve other people. And so for some of you, money may not be an issue. Like, you may just sneeze and you accidentally made money. Like, that's fine. Okay, some of us are just called to finance the kingdom and to make money. So what's to stop you from going out and getting $5 gift cards to Fry's or $5 gift cards to QT or McDonald's or someplace that if someone asks for some help, you've got that ready to go, ready to give someone. For some of you, it might be time. You're just worried about time. You're like, gosh, I don't know what I can do with that. I think um, The reality is, are you willing to be interrupted in your daily schedule to let God use you to be a blessing to other people? Or is your daily calendar one area that you've yet to fully surrender to Jesus? That convicts me. I don't like being interrupted. Like if I'm in the middle of something, my wife will tell you I'm like locked in. And so she'll come in and just ask simple questions. And I'm just, I have these reactions that sometimes are way more vitriolic, there's a big word, than they ever need to be. Just because I'm annoyed. It's like, I'm in the middle of this and she knows I'm in the middle of this. Why does she think she's more important? And like, you know, it's just this whole internal struggle and yet God convicted me. Man, I have to be willing to let my wife, the most important person in my life, interrupt whatever it is that I'm doing. That's a way that I can show her that I love her. That's a way that we can show the Father that we love him when we are willing to let him interrupt whatever it is that we might be doing. The, the biggest principle from this, and really the big takeaway that I hope that we can take, the best way if you want to grow in this area is this. Um, how can you develop a heart that places your love for Jesus above your love for stuff? And I think the best way to do that is every so often, I'm not advocating that you do this all the time, but every couple of years for me, I want to make it a pattern that I give a gift that's large enough that I wince a little bit. I think that's an easy principle for us to kind of put into our lives. Give a gift every now and then. Give something that's so significant to a person who's in need, someone that you can step aside and you can help them. Give them something that is large enough that you kind of wince as you're making that withdrawal from the bank, whereas maybe you have to sell something to finance what it is that you're doing. Because ultimately what you're doing in that moment, yeah, you're gonna feel that sense of sadness uh, in your heart as you're giving that thing away, but whether it's writing out the check, withdrawing the cash from the bank, putting your PS5 up for sale on Craigslist, it's healthy to put yourself in situations where you can show God that he's more valuable to you than anything that you own. Because what you're doing in that moment, you're saying that you believe that the blessing that God will give you for having the generous heart is worth far more than any earthly possession. And I think that's the kind of heart that most of us want to have. We want to be able to look at the Lord and say, Jesus, you're better. You're better. You're more worth it than any of these things. You're better. So how do we walk this out in faith, right? I've just spent 30 minutes creating this tension that I think we all hear that and say, yeah, be unoffendable. I want to do that. I want to be that type of a person. Or be sacrificially generous. Yeah, I want to be that type of a person. And yet, uh, we'd probably look at that and find it reasonable, right? Like, we can see that and see how that would be a valuable thing for us to put into place in our lives. And the reality is we're going to walk out of the church doors and life is going to happen. Someone will attack your integrity. Someone will challenge a deeply held belief and you're going to lash out. That's okay. 
You'll be in a situation uh, where maybe you can give and yet you're exhausted and it's been a long day. And you just, you don't want to deal with yet another interruption. You just want to get home. So what do we do? What would Jesus want us to do? What we have to be careful to not do is to just become Christian legalists who try to work our way to perfection. There's no magic checklist for this. You notice I'm I'm not giving you a whole lot that you can do. Why? Because uh, the temptation in a situation like this is to start making a list and be like, okay, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. And we start to work our way into this legalistic mindset that we can become the type of person that Jesus wants to be because we've worked hard enough to be that. And I'm telling you, that is not the gospel. That's not the gospel. That's not the message that Jesus has come to bring his people. So what do we do? Firstly, we need to look to Jesus as our example. And I know that this is the second or third time maybe in in the last couple of months that I've used this as a point of application in a sermon, but that's because it's true. And that's because we need to be constantly reminded that Jesus is and always will be our example and we have to look to him constantly for the reminder that he didn't resist evil when it was done to him. Jesus didn't seek his own vengeance. He entrusted himself to the will of the Father. And secondly, because he didn't resist the evil that was done to him, he was able to trust the Father all the way to death on a cross. But the good news, that's what gospel means, the good news is that he didn't stay dead, right? He resurrected back to life. He ascended and he rules and he reigns today as an alive, risen king next to the Father. And so we serve this risen Savior who as he left, what did he do? He gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to live with inside of us. If we submit ourselves to following after Jesus and to living out his ways, So what does that do for us? What it does for us is it allows us to live in the gospel every moment of every day. That's it. First, we have to look to Jesus as the example. And secondly, we have to actively live in the gospel. Notice, when I try to work my way to perfection, I'm ignoring the gospel. And Jack and I were at something recently. We heard a guy, his name is Steve Cuss. Uh, His website is stevecusswords.com. That's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's so funny. Pastor out of Denver, and he said this, when we stop relying on Jesus, we're relying on our own self-righteousness. That's not gospel. We can't do that. We have to live in the gospel and remember, Jesus paid it all so that I can be a person who doesn't have to live offended all the time. Jesus paid it all so that I can be a sacrificially generous person who's ready to receive uh, whatever command the Lord is gonna give me in the moment and actually do it. When we're actively living in the gospel, when we have this awareness of the gospel in our lives, uh, it allows us to to take that vacancy that's in our souls. If we're being honest, a lot of times when we lash out, we're doing that because there's a hole, there's a void in our our, our own hearts that we're trying to fill. And we need to uh, be redeemed, right? Like if we've been insulted, we just, we wanna look good. And yet when we constantly remember the gospel and live actively in the gospel, I already know that I'm loved by the Father. I'm loved perfectly. I'm received perfectly. And I don't have to do anything to earn his favor or his grace. It's already there for me. Even in the moment when I I didn't give, when I could have given. Even in the moment when I took great offense to something and I totally lashed out. The forgiveness is ready and available and it's there. And I want to be the type of person who lives in that moment. Remembering the gospel is there for my failures. Why? So I don't have to keep living in those failures. But when we have that active awareness of the gospel working itself out in our lives, it's amazing, isn't it? how we just slowly start to see our character transformed to be more like Christ. And it's not because of anything I've done. It's just simply because I'm aware of the work that God is doing in me, and I'm aware of what God is doing in other people. And so now I see them as people made in the image of God. I see them as children of God, that God wants to take care of, and God wants to help, and God wants to bless. And I get to see myself as an agent of that activity. And so I get to bring that gospel truth, not just into my life, but into those moments. When we are actively living in the gospel and we actively live in the love of the Father, we're able to forgive quickly. 
We're able to love unconditionally and we get to trust God to, to render his righteous judgments. And what does that allow for us? Jesus says it allows us to flourish. We can be the Macario's people. And so let's live in gospel truth this week. In the next few days, how can you pray in the spirit and pray to have that awareness of the gospel and everything that you do? Ask Jesus to show you how you can be like him because we flourish when we find ourselves free to live unoffended and free to sacrificially give when others uh, are in need. Let's be Makarios people. Let's be Telios people. Let's live the blessed life. Let's live the whole life. Amen? I'm gonna ask the band to come back up on stage. Um, but just as we kind of wrap up tonight, we're gonna sing a song here in a moment. Um, and it's called More Like Jesus. And I just wanna challenge you. Uh, let's, ma- let's make this song tonight. Let's just make this our prayer. Let's make this our heart's cry. What would it look like if we could be a church of people who are committed to looking more like Jesus every single day? Man, what would it look like if we could bring the gospel into every situation because we want to be more like Jesus? And so um, just if you'd bow your heads and pray with me, God, we want to thank you for tonight. We want to thank you for your word uh, that challenges us. It really does. Gosh, even looking at this tonight, I'm just like, there's so many ways that I know that I, I dropped the ball here. And so I thank you for your grace that's readily available for all of us. But we want to be, we want to be Teleos people. We want to be people who don't have to respond and react and get our way in every situation. That's ugly. We've all seen what that looks like when it's taken to the extreme. And so God, we just submit ourselves to you tonight. And thank you that the the reminder of your gospel truth is never far away. That in any and every moment, we can think back and see how your grace has been active in our lives and it can call us back to the truth that you love us, that you receive us as we are. And yet you love us so much, you won't let us stay there when we place ourselves in you. And so maybe uh, you're here tonight and you're you're hearing all this and you're like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what gospel is. I don't know what that is, but you talk about wholeness. I want that. And if that's you, I just want to invite you uh, to come have a conversation with us so that we can tell you about these gospel truths, that Jesus loves you so much, that he died on a cross to take on the sins of the world. And that includes your sins, my sins, and he didn't stay dead. He came back to life and now as the one who controls life, who controls death, he's free to give that out. And he wants to give that life to any person who's willing to receive what he did for you. So if you wanna receive that grace into your life, make sure you come see me, make sure you come see Jack tonight. One of us uh, will be in the back or down front so that you can come and we can have that conversation. But Jesus, uh, just in this moment, remind us of your gospel love for us. Remind us that that's the power to save. That's what Paul says in Romans, that we don't have to work our way to you. We just have to live in it. Help us be people in the coming days who just constantly snap our mind back to that truth and just live in that truth, Lord. Continue to move in this time as we worship you, Father. Continue to speak to us. We love you. We pray in your name. Amen.
prayer, isn't it? Let's just take uh, that song and those words and let's carry that with us into this week. That would be our heart.
to be more like Jesus. So just real quickly, uh, as we get ready to go, I wanna remind you, we've got the potluck that's gonna be happening next Sunday night. Um, it's not gonna be a great potluck unless we have people bringing stuff. So that's the gentle reminder that if you've got the church app, make sure you go to the link that's in that church app and sign up just so that we can know who's bringing what. It's not that we're trying to like, you know, micromanage the situation. We just wanna make sure there's enough food, uh, really is what it is. So just if you could go to the link and just let us know if you're bringing a, a main dish or a side, that would be awesome. Uh, the other thing is maybe you make an awesome dessert. I don't know, maybe you make a delicious sopapilla cheesecake. Just an example. Maybe you make homemade ice cream, you know? So uh, whatever it is, uh, make sure that you let Jack or uh, me or Matt know. Uh, come and talk to us because we want to auction those off as something that we want to help uh, use to raise, uh, to raise the funds to, to help send some kids to camp. So that's going to be next week after service, just in the gym behind us. So come ready to eat afterward. We're excited about that. Um, we're going to have the 10-minute party in the back. Jack's already back there. He can't wait to meet if you're new and if this is your first time and he has the best kettle corn this side of the Grand Canyon ready for you. It's back there, hot off the press. Not really, probably came out of the freezer, but that's fine. Uh, it actually freezes well. I don't know if you knew that about uh, kettle corn. So fun facts about kettle corn. You all learned that tonight. So uh, dinner tonight's gonna be at Cereal Grillers, the one that's up on Craycroft uh, and Speedway. So uh, make sure you join us for that if you wanna hang out afterward and eat some delicious fried food or pizza. Maybe both, I don't know. Uh, you do you. So uh, let me pray for us as we dismiss God. Uh, thanks for tonight. Thanks for just the words that you've brought to us. My heart for every person that's here, whether it be something from the worship, a lyric, uh, something from the message, a line, a scripture, would something imprint itself on our hearts right now? Would you help us to carry that thought over the coming days and to really pick it apart to figure out what is it you're saying to us, God? What is it that you want uh, to do in our hearts, in our lives? How is it you wanna transform us to be more like Jesus as we live actively in the gospel and seek to put this into practice? Pray your blessing over every person here that it would go forth before them, that your favor would go with them as well, Lord, uh, and that you just bring us back next week. We're excited to gather again to worship your name and to eat delicious food that we've all made for each other to enjoy. So we love you, Jesus. We pray it all in his name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Have a great night.